Okay. Uh, so, Karen Myers, thank you for taking the time to uh, talk with me today. Uh, uh, you're very uh, uh, forward-looking, uh, forward-doing in your work with uh, the use of data around policy development. You've been involved in Canadian policy development in a number of areas. Uh, but now you're uh, president and CEO of an organization called Blueprint. So I was, uh, would like you just to introduce yourself by uh, telling me about the work that Blueprint does and the role you have there and, and what your, how your career led you to this point. Okay, sure. So um, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to, to talk with you. So let me start by telling you what Blueprint is, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my career and how I arrived at Blueprint and a little bit more about what Blueprint does. So Blueprint is a nonprofit organization. We operate like a consulting firm and um, we work with leaders across Canada. Uh, we like to say that we use evidence to bring clarity to complexity. We help decision makers use real time, real world evidence to create innovative solutions. Um, and our goal is to drive change and improve the lives of Canadians. I started my career, uh, I did a master's in sociology, and then I started my career in consulting in the private sector. I was working primarily with large companies and my focus was on uh, improving performance, process engineering, and I, I love doing this work. I learned a lot about what it takes to manage projects, be responsive, and understand the needs of clients. After a few years though of honing these skills, um, I found myself really wanting to make more of a difference in the world. So um, I thought what, how best to do this. I uh, had a friend who suggested that learning more about public policy would be an important part of my journey. And I ended up doing a master's at Queen's in public administration. And um, that was a really exciting, really eye-opening experience for me. I got really engaged in understanding the process of research. I had an economics professor, Arthur Sweetman, who introduced me to the importance of using data and evidence to make public policy and program decisions. And that was really um, life-changing, career-altering for me. Uh, this uh, getting introduced to data and the difference it could make ignited my passion to develop my research skills. And from there, I decided to do a PhD. And I was in very fortunate enough to have a really brilliant, generous advisor, uh, John Miles is his name. And he introduced me to the rigor of analytical thinking and to advanced data analysis techniques. I knew from the start my goal was not to become an academic. And um, John was really comfortable with that decision from the start. In fact, he spent uh, half of his time with Statistics Canada. So the notion of being an applied researcher was something that he uh, was really familiar with and, and, a, and a champion of. Um, so that was, that's what I had an eye to doing from the beginning of my PhD. And um, as I finished my PhD, I got a job with the Ontario government, and that was a really great opportunity to learn how policy is developed from the inside. Uh, but what I also quickly learned was I really wasn't well suited to bureaucracy and that um, at heart, I was more of an entrepreneur. I also really craved the opportunity to use the research skills that I had developed. So I ended up leaving government to work for an organization that did applied research and program evaluation. After I had been doing this for a while, um, what I, I started to realize is while I appreciated the rigor that this organization brought to the work, um, I, what I was looking to do was to find a way to take this rigor and combine it with a more people-centered, more innovative, more agile approach. And in some ways, 
what I was looking to do was to marry up my uh, policy skills with my research skills with my consulting skills that uh, I had developed at the beginning of my career. And um, after a bit of time, I realized that the best way to do that was actually to start my own organization. And um, that was how Blueprint was born. Wonderful. So, and, yeah, just, and of course, data today is especially uh, important. We don't always see uh, governments perhaps giving it that emphasis that it needs. Uh, I was also keen to, uh, you know, at, at the beginning of our discussion, ask about the areas of policy development that you think it's most important uh, for governments, or particularly the Canadian government, uh, to focus on today. So we're going to talk about the policy development process, uh, but I was interested just to uh, let the students know uh, the types of areas that what we're talking about might be applied to. Yeah, so great question. And I think it backed your work and uh, the focus of your course. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of issues that, that are surfacing a lot of issues that are really important uh, for today, for our economy, for our policymakers and for society. So um, I could uh, maybe summarize in three big questions. Um, some of the areas that, gov that are most important for government to be paying attention to. So first, how are new technologies transforming the nature of work and the set of skills that enable people to thrive in a digital economy? So first question, nature of work and the set of skills that people need. Um, second, how can we shape and catalyze technological innovation to complement and augment human potential? So how can we use technology for good? And then third, how can uh, our civic institutions ensure that the gains from these emerging innovations contribute to equality of opportunity, social inclusion, and shared uh, prosperity? So here, uh, inclusive economic growth. And there's a lot of work that we need to do to, uh, to help our institutions uh, evolve and adjudge. So these are, these are some pretty big questions. And I think one thing to, that I really wanted to zero in on, because something that really gets lost uh, as we're thinking about these big questions, um, and especially in Ontario, when um, Ontario is a world leader, in educational attainment, right? We are always at the top in, in whatever way you want to measure it. Uh, but with all of the success, one of the things that's really easy to forget is the 1.8 million Ontarians in prime working age, 25 to 54 year olds, who do not have post-secondary credentials. And one of the things that researchers have started to draw our attention to is uh, over the past three decades, how much uh, further behind this group has fallen. And uh, one statistic in particular, labor force participation really tells this story. So um, over the past three decades, the labor force participation rate for prime working age men without credentials has fallen by about 10%. And this is a really significant statistic. And, you know, as we're thinking about technology and the role technology can play and how we need to harness technology in our institutions, I always want to bring it back to people and, um, and to, to really have front and center who's being left behind and how we need to think about inclusive policies to ensure that everyone has their best possible chance to succeed. Absolutely. And uh, interesting that you also, you know, based the, uh, your understanding uh, of what you think is important with policy on the impact that technology is having uh, on society. Uh, your focus is partly on policy development and how you think that that can be improved. So, uh, so I thought I would ask you how policy development usually happens and what you think can be done to improve it? Okay, so great question. So of course we're all familiar with cynical views that policy development is opportunistic and driven largely by politics. 
Um, but I don't, um, sure there's an element of that, but that's not where I largely um, place my emphasis. And, um, you know, we, we um, as I'm sure you and your students are familiar with, um, we have the rational viewpoint where policy development is a coherent and logical process and thinking about policies like linear steps, analysis, evidence, uh, predictable policy aligned with well-formulated goals. And we know that that's what is in policy textbooks. But, but not, in fact, what actually happens um, to a large extent in reality. Um, sometimes we hear policymaking process described as irrational, that policymaking happens or when problems, solutions, or opportunities happen to align, um, which makes policy change somewhat unpredictable and ambiguous. Um, and there's some truth to this. And um, organizations that have policy agendas and are trying to influence how policy is developed, um, savvy ones recognize this and are ready when these opportunities emerge. So um, what, we, what we think about at Blueprint is that there's some truth to all of these perspectives and our focus is on the toolkit. What is the toolkit? Um, the diverse toolkit that's needed given the complexity of the policymaking process and how can we bring our expertise to bear to improve that process. And one of the biggest areas where we are focused at Blueprint is um, helping the policy process become more data driven. How can we use data to improve the design and delivery of government services? And that's something that there's a lot of interest in government right now for that. And um, um, whether it's driven by efficiency, effectiveness, equity goals, uh, all of these things are important and using data can help us move forward in all of these areas. Thank you. And you've led many policy development processes, uh, both at Blueprint and before. Uh, some of these uh, may have been very complex. Uh, how did you do that? What, what do you do to effectively develop uh, a policy? So we want to help governments use data to learn what works, for whom, and under what conditions. We want to encourage governments to think about learning, experimentation, um, and increasing the amount of evidence that's actually available, and then to use this evidence to make informed decisions. Once these decisions are made, then the focus becomes about building capacity to implement according to evidence-based practices, and then to monitor and evaluate uh, and create a cycle of continuous improvement that's driving towards results. So um, our approach, we wanna take that rigorous analysis and that focus on data um, and combining it with uh, like a real understanding of government priorities, constraints, and op opportunities. And it's this integrated approach that enables us to create solutions that are credible to government and to a wide range of stakeholders, things that work in the real world and that are going to generate lasting impact. So what you're describing is a, a process-oriented approach uh, supported by evidence or data uh, to policy development. That's what I'm I think I'm hearing you uh, describe, uh, and and what you what this might be described as, I guess, would be that you there is more evidence in use, but also there's the potential for uh, more innovation in the sense that the process itself uh, promotes creativity and introduction of new thinking perhaps around innovation. Could you talk a little bit about the innovation aspect of the policy process that you're describing? Yeah, sure. And let, let me talk about one particular area where innovation is really needed. So, um, and it is the design of services. So much of government 
services are designed in a way that is just based on their legacy services. They were the thing, way things were always done and society has changed. Our needs, our preferences, technology has changed and we've often still got the same services that were designed in a post-World War II era. So one of the ways that people have been talking about how service uh, design can be improved is what people call people-centered strategies. And I'll give you an example of what um, this means in the context of youth employment. So for many youth, finding employment, it's going to be about, it's, it's more complicated. We all know the importance of soft skills, but it's more complicated than that. More and more young people are dealing with complex barriers like food insecurity, the effects of childhood trauma, and persistent mental health challenges. So to make progress towards their employment goals, uh, youth need help overcoming these barriers. There are a lot of services out there, but navigating them is like a tangled web. Youth services are provided across a, like a dizzy, uh, dizzying array of delivery systems and are often only available to youth who meet very specific age, income, education criteria. They're often time limited and youth fall through the cracks. So what we need is a more holistic approach and, um, and a real understanding of how what youth what their preferences are, what their needs are. And um, to do this, we need to overcome what is a really fragment, fragmented and siloed funding environment. Uh, community organizations right now are burdened by multiple sources of funding with different rules, different reporting requirements, and this can make it really hard to be responsive. So um, one, of the, one of the types of in, um, innovations we're seeing is an example of this would be integrated youth service hubs. These hubs bring together mental health, substance use, um, and employment services all together in one model. And um, in this model, employment counselors collaborate with the mental health counselors, local employers, educational institutions, and they help youth identify their interests, their skills, match them to employment and education. And then the counselors support youth on their journey for as long as they need it. And so we, there are demonstration projects that are uh, testing this model across the country right now. So Blueprint is collaborating with the Center for Addictions and Mental Health um, on this intervention. There's funding from the Future Skills Center, from the federal government, and um, we are looking at how well this works, uh, for what type of youth, under what types of conditions, and we're also looking at the implementation path factors and we're looking at the extent to which this type of intervention, if we do find that it works, how it could be successful at scale. So this is like just one example of the type of innovation that's needed and the type of approach that we're taking to, to develop this in, these innovative models, to test them and to think about how they can be scaled. Very interesting because what it sounds to me like you're describing is that the the incremental uh, an incremental approach to that uh, uh, you know diversity of offerings that are available now wouldn't be enough that you need something fairly innovative more radical to a degree perhaps uh, and at the same time that you want to be able to base your uh, understanding of that uh on data that would be able to support whether or not it's being effective and, and that seems to be a change from perhaps the way uh policy development has been approached in the past you're looking at a way to effectively develop policy that will work that is innovative and but to, in it where necessary i guess uh, uh, uh more radical to an extent i don't mean that in terms of its place on the political spectrum, but more in the sense of the uh, uh, the the, uh, the extent of the change that is being proposed by the policy. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Like what got us here 
is not going to get us where we need to go. And so we really do need to be looking at new ways of doing things. But this is not about a whiteboard exercise or, um, a, you know, a bunch of um, MBA graduates getting together and uh, writing models up on paper. We need to be able to really understand in a deep way um, what citizens need, um, what their preferences are related to delivery, and we need to design and test. We need to test, learn, and adapt. And there really aren't any shortcuts to doing that. Which is how it would be approached in business in the sense that we would have a continuous improvement process or an innovation process that enabled things to be tried out with, that would base uh, what we did on data and uh, you're almost bringing that business approach to uh, policy uh, as well. Part of the reason this is, I think, necessary is, is that we're using technology more, the world is changing more quickly, uh, and the policy development process uh, perhaps has to match that to be able to uh, develop policy that's going to work more quickly maybe than it has before, or certainly to be responsive to those things which are happening. To what extent can information technology help with the policy development process itself? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really great question. So um, technological advances um, certainly have made data uh, more data available and um, available in ways that are analyzable. And um, so we hear a lot about the open data movement and there's a connection to the open government uh, movement, which is a movement that focuses on transparency, accountability and citizen participation. At the same time, we have technological advances that kind of pull us in the other direction. Um, some, you know, uh, to some extent, social media orients us to talking rather than listening and um, pulls us in directions away from facilitating dialogue to deeper understanding. So, you know, we've certainly got technological advances that are pulling us in both directions. An area uh, where Blueprint is uh, doing work and um, we're making increasing investments in this area is around building capacity to use data and to use data productively to improve policy, uh, program design and delivery. So we're really, um, and in this world we're thinking about data analysis as a, as a skill of the future, right? And one that's become increasingly important um, we know demand for data scientists, engineers, it's um, just uh, growth is skyrocketing. Um, but well, private sector organizations, and you talked a little bit about this when we were talking about the last question, they really rushed to build data capacity within government and in the community sector, we're lagging behind. And so Blueprint is thinking, how can we start to close this data capacity gap? So with funding uh, from the Future Skills Center, which is a federally funded initiative, uh, we just launched an initiative to empower community organizations to use their own data to learn and improve. And here, what we're trying to do is build a culture of evidence-informed decision-making by working with stakeholders to build capacity for data-driven learning and for continuous growth. We're going to uh, work to improve the data analysis infrastructure and in some ways we're going to be proof of concept for government. And if um, organizations that, are gov that governments are funding are able to stand up and look and see, hey, we're becoming more data-driven, then I think that can really um, shine a mirror up for government and uh, show the path forward to government, in fact, being more data-driven. And I think that's something that's really uh, very keenly needed. And you described part of the reason for that being keenly needed as being the, the uh, social media and the uh, perhaps misinformation that there is uh, around political-related uh, issues. Uh, and the need for 
what governments do to be based on data par partly to deal with that. But I was interested that you say social media is causing people to focus very short term in their thinking. Uh, uh, politicians as well, we've seen their use of social media. Uh, and, uh, and so your emphasis is on saying, okay, we need to sit down very carefully, consider what government should do uh, and to use data both to design that and uh, in the implementation and execution process of that. Yeah, yeah. And what we're seeing is community organizations that are serving some of our most vulnerable citizens are, in fact, deeply motivated to use data to better understand needs and then to design services and then like track and follow what happens to the people they serve, right, as they go through the journey of using services and then moving forward in their lives. So we, you know, we actually think that community organizations um, if there is that opportunity for uh, capacity building can be real champions of data driven approaches. So we're really excited about this. We, we have an open call for proposals right now. We're looking for 10 community organizations across Canada and um, we're gonna be working with them over the next two years to build this capacity. And then we'll have these proof of concepts that we really hope will um, lead to more and more change and more data-driven approaches. And this, this certainly, I mean, one of the subjects I teach is technology entrepreneurship. And you know that reflects that same approach of developing proofs of concept, going out and trying them out as quickly as you can. Uh, and uh, then uh, you know deciding what to do next, whether you pivot or or whether you abandon the idea because it didn't work, or whether you move forward to uh, uh, to make it bigger. But the uh, uh, but that that is very much you know the lean entrepreneurship approach, and uh, and it certainly does seem to fit with policy and government activity as well. One of the things that all of this is based on is what is happening. Uh, in employment, you described that as being uh, an area that you thought was very important and you, the examples that you've given have looked at this area. Uh, but I just wanted maybe to talk a little bit more about that, the, the impact that automation uh, and technology is having on work and the challenge of fast job and skill change. And maybe, you know, if you would talk about that a little bit more uh broadly in terms of what, what governments should be doing about it. yeah so this is just a massive um issue and we know from our work from uh, public opinion surveys and other types of research that canadians are deeply worried uh about the challenges that increasing automation will bring as they seek economic security for themselves and for their families so economists and other researchers who study these trends have been really uh, trying to better understand the nature and the magnitude of changes that automation will bring. Um, there's been lots of modeling about the impact of automation. Most of it's experimental. Uh, economists are using new approaches, non-traditional data sources to inform their projections. And with this comes a lot of uncertainty. So, and we now know that some of the early predictions around automation were in fact quite simplistic and did not really hit the mark. Uh, early estimates talked about the demise of massive numbers of jobs and they, they, things didn't really unfold the way that uh, uh, some researchers thought they would. Um, so let me say a little bit more about this. Early estimates simply looked at an occupation's overall suitability for machine learning. And now we're getting a little bit better at identifying some of the things that might stand in the way. So particular attention is being paid to what people call bottleneck tasks. And these are tasks that are difficult to automate because they require a high degree of perception, creativity, or social intelligence. So while an op uh, occupation it might have high overall suitability for machine learning, it may also have these bottleneck tasks that may slow or even prevent 
automation. So now research is looking at a wider range of cultural, social, financial barriers that prevent or slow automation. And, and also some things that can be done to move us in positive directions as well too. For example, good design job. Um, um, good job design may ensure that the adoption of machine learning can actually enhance rather than displace jobs. So, um, but you know, regardless, we don't need to take a strong stand on the reliability of these predictions to understand how important it is to act now. The impacts of automation, AI, they're already right in front of us. And we know that we are moving towards an incredibly polarized labor market. In one hand, we have dramatic growth in what people call frontier jobs. These are jobs that embrace production and use of new technology, and they're highly paid. They're held disproportionately by educated, uh, educated particularly men. And um, on the other hand, we have what people call last mile jobs, like an Amazon order picker, these jobs involve carrying out nearly automated tasks that require only a residual of human abilities. And these jobs are typically held by individuals without post-secondary education and they pay, they pay well below average wages. So our labor market is polarized in terms of skill requirements and wage levels. So um, a defining question of our time is uh, most certainly how we can ensure that all Canadians, especially those without post-secondary, have the skills that they need, not just to survive, but to thrive. Yeah, I spoke to someone uh, a few weeks ago who said, uh, you know, that the issue uh, in jobs was about good jobs, uh, giving people good jobs and jobs that had an element of progression to them. I think they called it transition, uh, you know, the movement through from school to the workforce and then uh, uh, progression uh, in their career. And uh, rather than, I mean, this was in the context of talking about the universal basic income and whether that was a good idea. And uh, their argument was, and it seemed very sensible to me, that we didn't so much need to give people a basic income at the bottom of that would keep them uh, 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 relatively poor, but rather what we needed to focus on was good jobs, and I thought that made that made perfect sense. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yes, yeah, good jobs and providing people with security to transition from job to job in a progressive way. Yeah, and uh, it was, uh, another discussion I had with, was with someone from the International Labour Organization and their focus on transition I thought was very interesting. They were talking about it around developing countries, uh, but certainly all the same arguments were applicable, I thought, in developed countries and, and increasingly so, uh, uh, perhaps. I'm not sure what the data says on that for, at the moment. Uh, for the reasons that you've said about the difficulty in, you know, having uh, in the way that the studies have been done. Okay, I also wanted to ask you about uh, the Canadian government's management of the recovery after COVID-19. You wrote an article on this uh, that said this should be evidence-based, but also that it should apply rapid learning and uh, both of things which you've mentioned already. Uh, but I thought I would ask you to talk about that in the context of COVID-19. Yeah, so what we were really trying to do in this article was really uh, marry up the need for innovation. Uh, COVID has required us to innovate in ways that, you know, and, and more quickly, right? Some people talk about, um, you know, changes in four months that would have taken a decade to um, occur under other uh, circumstances. So innovation is is front and center and, and, and in, a, in a really rapid way. And so what we need is evidence generation that can keep pace with these rapid changes. So, um, 
we we love random control trials and really being able to apply rigorous evaluation approaches to isolating program impacts so that we can really learn like what difference does this program make um but what what we can't afford um in perhaps the way we used to is to do these random control trials in ways that take like three or four years you know say a million dollars three or four years to to wait for the results uh, to find out whether program X works in community Y. And then meanwhile, that labor market has changed, right? And it, it, the results are no longer relevant. So we talk about rapid learning, right? In this context, in being able to set up uh, test, learn and adapt uh, methodologies that can help us understand what's working in real time. So um, we make the case in this, in this article that evidence should in fact become part of the DNA of Canada's recovery efforts, but we're really specific about what we mean by that type of evidence. So we're talking about being creative, agile, pragmatic in our approach to generating evidence. Um, we talk about the importance of uh, using data to learn what's working on the ground, uh, prioritizing constituent voice, and placing a strong emphasis on understanding needs and experience, and also having a feedback loop so that we're connecting the evidence generated um, to actual ongoing government uh, decision making. Hmm. Interesting. And, and it, we've seen that sort of uh, uh, focus, I guess, people have been looking at how uh, research can change in these ways in academia as well, where we look at action research and things which will allow us to move to consider how things will exist in the future, rather than simply looking at in the past. But of course, that also uh, has featured in lean entrepreneurship too. But we see these types of developments in a number of areas where we're concerned to be able to do things better more quickly, basically. And uh, that uh, it's interesting that it exists in, in policy development as well. I just got one final question, which was, is that a lot of the people who are watching this will be at the beginning of their careers. Uh, I like to ask everybody I interview, uh, whether you, uh, what the words of advice would be that you would like to share with them. Okay, so yeah, interesting question. Um, so my answer to this might be a little different. Uh, now, after having lived through this last year of the pandemic, um, so certainly one thing that I would say now that I might add to what I would usually say is um, we need, really need to find ways to come out of this crisis less selfish than how we were when we went into it. And, you know, to really like, first step to dreaming of a better future is to let ourselves be touched by the pain of others. And I actually really mean this in a very um, uh, positive and optimistic way. And so connecting it up to the things that, something that I tell my daughter and to the talented young researchers that join Blueprint, um, always be curious and always be optimistic. Be curious about the world around you, be curious about the people closest to you, as well as the people you've never met. And we should always, um, always be learning um, and always keep fresh our desire to listen and to change and um, be optimistic. When we are talking about pain of others, we need to believe in finding solutions and we don't want to just focus on what's wrong or hard. We want to focus on what we can do about it. Being hopeful and acting as even uh, our most complex challenges can be solved. Wonderful. Thank you. And I hope we do uh, come out of it uh, better for it, perhaps, if, if that's possible. Uh, uh, we certainly are seeing lots of examples of people looking after their neighbours and, uh, you know, being perhaps more friendly in some ways, uh, in some uh, in some areas. But thank you mm -hmm. for talking to me today, Karen. I, I really appreciate it. It's going to be very valuable for the students uh, at the University of Waterloo. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. 
Okay, well, thank you. It's been a pleasure.